Well, the world has gone through rather extraordinary times of the past few years, to say the least. So on the one hand, the report reflects that. The first thing is the recognition that some of these catastrophes were labeled low probability events before. Uh, there is a recognition that they are no low probability event anymore. Uh, they're much more likely to happen today than maybe 10 or 15 years ago. That said, uh, we've interviewed close to 500 experts and leaders in many countries, in the public, private sectors, NGO world, experts in academia. And clearly we see a big difference in risk perception. In uh, January 2007, we issued the Global Risk Report 2007, and that was discussed at the annual meeting in Davos. And at that time, one of the top risks we had highlighted was asset price collapse. But remember, that was a time of uh, great exuberance, and only a few people pay attention to what we had to say. Obviously, after that, people tended to pay more attention to what the report had to say. And just looking back at what the report told us last year, well, two, two or three of the top risks of last year's report were first, economic disparity, and the impact that will have on the second one, which is geopolitical risk. The report can be used in different manners, but the first one is the identification of these risks. So I think it's important to know what could happen. It's not just to tell people that there are 50 global risks out there, but also how you can start thinking more strategically about how you as a CEO of a large corporation, at the head of a large NGO, as a head of government or ruler, can start approaching these risks. The tragedy that we've seen in Japan in March 2011 was not just a Japanese issue. That has become a worldwide issue because of the ripple effect on global supply chain worldwide, on financial market worldwide. And Japan was one of the most, if not the most, prepared country in the world to face with, to be faced with earthquake. Maybe the key lesson to you as a leader to take away from these initiatives is, what's well, it's not the risk you know most that going to kill you. These are the risk you select or choose to ignore, consciously or unconsciously. You have the risk you care most about, but look at the other risk, one way or another than may affect you tomorrow. It's very hard to imagine what would happen if we fail to manage that interconnection. And just let me give you an example of, and that's a financial crisis really. You take a look at um, what we call the market valuation of all publicly traded companies around the world in uh, September 2007 or October 2007. That was about $60 trillion of all publicly traded companies worldwide. The value, the stock value was about $62, $63 trillion. So that's 63 thousand billions of dollars. It's a big number. 15 months later, after the crisis, uh, that had dropped 50 percent. So these companies worldwide had literally lost 30 trillion dollars of assets. Just to give you a reference point, that's about what all European countries, the United States of America and Japan combined, had produced the GDP gross domestic product during 2008. So hundreds of millions of workers going to work every day and producing that fantastic growth and economic value, all of that was destroyed in a matter of months, literally. Before that, everybody thought that will never happen. After that, I think we have to reconsider these extreme events in a very different manner. First, you have to know your risk. You have to assess your exposure, quantify this risk try to better understand their interdependency. That's critical here. Ask yourself for your company or your country, what are my centers of gravity? Put these issues on the agenda of your board of directors. Ask for a very frank discussion about what our vulnerabilities really are today. Don't pretend they will not happen. Don't pretend everything is under control. You're a successful business because a lot of things are indeed under control. But at the same time, you need to think about the next five, 10 years, and doing that type of exercise is really, really important. There are massive opportunities out there. If you're a CEO of a corporation, you can think about how do I apply my knowledge and expertise to a much more volatile and uncertain world? 
what type of new products, what type of new technologies, what type of services can we develop, what type of business opportunities that are out there. There will be winners and losers. And the winners will be the one who not only understand the risk, protect their assets and human capital, but go one step further, asking themselves, what business opportunities are out there? What societal opportunities are out there? Do I want to be that country at the head of state that it's much more stable politically because I've handled this risk aspect? And by the way, when you're stable politically, what happened? Well, you have massive foreign investment flooding to your countries and you create jobs and that's a very positive circle where more jobs are created, more political stability, more economic growth. So that's really what we have been uh, partnering with the World Economic Forum for the past seven years, trying to turn risk management into value creation.